virgin, most powerful radio, sharing the gospel with clarity and charity. And now, Virgin Most Powerful Radio is pleased to present Hands-On Apologetics with renowned Catholic author and apologist, Gary Machuda. And welcome, everybody. Hands on apologetics. You have entered into Virgin Most Powerful's Apologetics Dojo. It's great to be with you today to do our adventure into explaining, sharing, defending the faith with clarity, charity, and confidence. Got a great show in store for you. I also want to uh, ask for your prayers because I'm going to be on Catholic Answers Live tonight, the, the first segment. I know at Easter time, that's 6 p.m. Going to be talking about the Bible and what the Bible assumes you already know. Uh, that's going to be a lot of fun. I don't think I've ever given an interview on that particular book, which, by the way, is available free. You could get a copy of it. It's just basically a compilation of all my articles that I've written at for the Michigan Catholic uh, on my website, which is handsonapologetics.com. But the only reason I'm bringing this up is because I... Uh, ask for your prayers because uh, we need prayers and and I need prayers definitely whenever I'm on the show. Hopefully you pray for me all the time, but maybe if you could say an extra prayer tonight, I appreciate it. Uh, anyway, back to the show. We have a great show in store for us because our good friend William Hemsworth is a convert to the Catholic faith. Uh, for those who are familiar with his uh, story, he was once very much involved in Freemasonry. And he's going to come back on. We're going to talk about Freemasonry and kind of go in depth and especially his own experience from within the organization. So that's going to be coming up on the other side of the break. Also, as always, we look at a finding the fallacy. We look at informal fallacy. Today's informal fallacy is the argument from silence. And also we meet an early church father. Today's early church father is someone that you're probably already familiar with if you listened a few days ago when we were talking about just a martyr. That is Tatian the Syrian. Tatian the Syrian. And uh, so we got a lot of great stuff in store for you today. I don't know. I'm just in a strange mood. Uh, that's not good when you're on broadcast. But anywho, um, let's start with, as we always do, I want to welcome all of you watching live stream on Facebook, YouTube, and all the other platforms we live stream on. Hello, everybody. Welcome aboard. Welcome to the dojo. Also, I want to welcome all of you listening on radio around the country and via podcast around the world through either our handy-dandy phone app or um, via our flagship website, the powerhouse, virginmostpowerfulradio.org where you can access not only all our programs, but all the other programs Virgin Most Powerful produces. And it gives you an opportunity to do a little evangelization because you can share those programs. You can tell people about them. You can listen to them again. Perhaps you're, maybe you're on your lunch hour or you're going into a meeting. You can't listen to the whole program. You can always catch it. You don't always have to get the whole thing live, although we appreciate it. And uh, through our flagship website or a handy-dandy phone app. So life is good. Um, yeah, One of the four horsemen of Catholic apologetics. Uh, I, I appreciate that. That's actually, George, you're quoting from the great Jesse Romero, aren't you? Who, by the way, who I include among the four horsemen as well. So uh, I, I appreciate that. Um, let's see. Uh, I know I forget. Oh, if you have any questions for William Alt. I almost said Albrecht. William Hemsworth, give us a call, 888-526-2151. It's 888-526-2151. Or you can always email your questions at handsonapologetics.com. That is questions at handsonapologetics.com. And I do get your emails when you do the proper address. <laughs> like I said, very strange mood today. Not Not exactly great for broadcasting. So without further ado, folks, why don't we jump into our Finding the Fallacy for today, which is the argument from silence. And, uh, yeah, this is a very, very common uh, fallacy. It happens a lot, especially for things that involve church history 
and it happens a lot in the field of the canon of Scripture. Um, as you know, I did a lot of work on the, the seven Old Testament books that Catholic and Orthodox Bibles have that Protestants don't have. And, man, an awful lot of argumentation really is an argument from silence in that area. But it's throughout all the whole area of apologetics. So what is the argument from silence? Well, make an argument from silence is to express a conclusion that is based on the absence of statements in historical documents rather than their presence. In other words, they're taking the absence of evidence as proof of the non-existence of something, as if something not being there is actually proof that something is entirely absent. Um, for example, they will say things like, well, let's take a deuterocanonical um, example. This is very common on uh, Protestant apologetics on the Old Testament canon. They'll say, well, Philo of Alexander never once quotes from the deuterocanon, which is true. He doesn't quote from the deuterocanon. But he also doesn't quote from an awful lot of proto-canonical books either. But nevertheless, his silence doesn't, silence cuts both ways, folks. It could either be a uh, affirmation or a denial. It, it really doesn't have any evidentiary value in and of itself. However, and this is important, there are special circumstances where silence could be used as evidence. But you have to do an awful lot of uh uh, argumentation to get that circumstance. For example, you would have to demonstrate that a person had to have stipulated as particular things in a particular circumstance in order uh, uh, so that the absence would be counted as a negation. I don't know if that makes any sense, but it'd be like saying m the only four things in the world that um, are enjoyable are the colors red, blue, orange, and green. Um, so you could use the silence on purple uh, not being included in the list as being a denial of purple being the most pleasurable things, according to the author. So th in the, that particular circumstance, since it's very well qualified that he's stipulating each and every example, that could be an instance where silence actually is uh, negative evidence, you know, against uh, a particular thing. But like I said, most people don't do that. They just assume, well, if so-and-so didn't say something, then it either didn't exist or they rejected it. And like I said, you get this a lot in church history. You get this a lot in uh, arguments on the canon, that type of thing. So beware, folks, the argument from silence. Silence is golden, but it's not golden evidence unless it's under those specific circumstances. Okay, let's jump to the Meet the Early Church. Father, for today... Who is Tadian the Syrian, who flourished around AD 165, 175? Very little is known of Tadian's life, and even less of his death. Uh, he was by birth a Syrian, born into paganism. Like just a martyr, uh, he sought the true philosophy and found it in Christianity. His wanderings brought him to Rome, where he became a pupil of Justin's school, Justin Martyr's school in Rome. But whether uh, he already was a Christian when he came to Rome or he converted there by Justin, we don't know. We simply don't understand. We don't have that data in front of us. Uh, Tatian was in all things an extremist. He returned to the East around the year 172 AD, where he founded a Gnostic sect called Incred of Incredites, known as the Aquarii, because of the fact that that their fanatical rejection of the use of wine was so inflexible that they substituted water for wine, even in the Eucharistic elements. Uh, others rejected or discouraged second marriages, uh, but Tatian's sect rejected even first marriages, which uh, quite possibly is a factor to be reckoned with in accounting for the sect's quick disappearance. Namely, they just didn't have any offspring. Uh, he's best remembered, however, for having arranged the Harmony of the Gospels called the Detesteron. Now, you might not be familiar with the idea of the Harmony of the Gospels. Basically, you have the three synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and then the fourth one, John. And 
as, especially if you read the first three Gospels, you notice they're, they cover the same material or similar material. And so there is a way in which you can line up all the Gospels, including John in some cases, where uh, basically you can have all the Gospels speaking to one particular instance after another. So that's known as a harmony of the Gospels. And so he's known for arranging the Gospels. And that is known as the Diatestaron. Until the 5th century, this was the official form of the Gospels used in the liturgy in the Syrian church. And it seems to have had considerable influence upon the gospel text of the whole church. Whether the original language of the Tetestaron was Greek or Syriac is still debated. Only fragments of the work have survived in either of these languages. Uh, But the entire text can be reconstructed from extant translations in Latin, Arabic, and quite remarkably, Middle Low Franconian. And of course, this comes from uh, Jurgen's faith of the early church fathers. Now, besides the Testron, we also have uh, Tatian's address to the Greeks, uh, which is the only extant work that we have from him outside the Testron. Uh, it's written not in Syriac, but in Greek, and it's dated around the time of the death of St. Justin Martyr, around 165. But whether before or after Tatian's founding the sect uh, of Aquarii, which uh, shortly after 172 A.D., it cannot be said with certainty. Uh, we cannot be far wrong, Jurgen says, in dating this work between the years 165-175. Tatian knew no moderation in discourse, and his address is filled with vertiptitude and invective, and where he decries the immorality of Greek pagans and especially by examples of their sculptures. And that is our early church father, Tati and Syria. And coming up next, we have our good friend William Hemsworth. We're going to be talking about Stay tuned, folks. Jesus said in Matthew 26, Stay awake and pray that you may not enter into temptation. According to St. Ephraim, Jesus, who feared nothing, experienced fear and asked to be freed from death, although he knew it was impossible. How much more must we persevere in prayer before temptation assails us, so that we may be freed when the test has come? May God grant that we may withstand temptation and carry out his will in all things. mom's going to have a baby? She is. Will it be a boy? Or will it be a girl? We don't know yet, but we heard the heartbeat, and my dad said this is going to be someone very special. You mean like being a president? Or maybe a doctor? Well, probably maybe like a singer or dancer, I think. Hello, my name is Marianne Koharski. I'm the director of Pro-Life Across America. We know that every baby is a miracle and has the potential to do great things. If you know someone who is pregnant or in need of alternatives or assistance or would like to support the work of Pro-Life Across America, please call 1-800-366-7773 or visit our website at prolifeacrossamerica.org. Pro-Life Across America is non-political and totally educational. Pro-Life Across America. This is Terry Barber. I want to thank you for your support here at Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Here's an easy way to do it. If you're going to sell or buy a house, call Real Estate for Life, 877-543-3871, because they're going to get you a Christ-centered agent to purchase your home or to sell your home. And at the close of escrow, a portion of his commission goes right back to Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Call 877-543-3871. Thank you so much for your support. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. 
And welcome back, everybody. We are going to be talking about Freemasonry, which is a very fascinating subject, and actually our guest has a lot of experience in Freemasonry, and it is William Hemsworth. By the way, William is a former ordained Baptist and Lutheran who converted to Catholicism while attending seminary. He is the husband and father of four who is passionate about passing the faith on and assist in teaching adults and children in his parish in Tucson, Arizona. He's also a popular author, blogger, podcaster. You can check out his stuff at williamhemsworth.com. Or you could also check out his uh, YouTube channel, The Bible Catholic. And uh, William, welcome back to Hands on Apologetics. Hey, thank you, Gary. Pleasure to be on. How are you doing today? Doing great. Uh, doing very well. And and you've been busy on YouTube. Uh, lots of great interviews. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, you, you've been on a couple times. I appreciate it. We've had Dr. Scott Hahn on. Uh, did an interview with uh, Steve Picorni of FreedomCoaching.net talking about sex trafficking. And Steve Ray was on. And Steve Ray's coming on again. We're going to talk about our Blessed Mother on Saturday. So really excited and very thankful for everyone uh, coming on. <laughs> it's been fun. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And uh, you can't ask for a better host. Uh, you know, you're you're so uh, calm, mild mannered and welcoming that uh, it's fun to watch your show. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it very much. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, this is interesting because this is a component of in, in some sense, you know, your conversion to the Catholic Church is uh, Freemasonry. I, I, I didn't realize until our last program that uh, that you were part of that movement right i was part of it probably for three or four years and pretty much at, at that point in my life i was just i was searching for truth like i knew there was something else i didn't have all of it and i i started searching and so i, I came across freemasonry and i met and a lot of the gentlemen that were involved with it were just they were really nice guys. They were great family men. They were very helpful in their community, and I was drawn to that. And so I inquired about it. And as I started searching more and more, I started realizing that, well, hey, Catholicism is true. It's kind of been there in front of me this in front of me this whole time. And when I, once I started uh, uncovering what the church taught about it, I was like I had to make a decision: Am I going to follow the church that Christ established? Or am I going to go my own way? It was like that fork in the road. I had to make that decision. And so ultimately, I, I decided, praise God, to follow his church. And couldn't be happier. Um, so, learning so much every day. Like you, know, like, you, like you know, Gary, there's so much to learn, so much to uncover. I mean, there's 2,000 years of tradition there. And in our lifetime, we can only begin to scratch the surface of it. And when we study our faith, it's just so exciting because there's just so much there no matter how much we think we know, what we maybe have covered is not novel. Someone hasn't covered it somewhere before and has elaborated on it in such a better way that maybe we can understand. And it's just that digging. That truth is there. The church has it there for us. It's free for the taking. And it's it's there. It's all there. Yeah, it's like a treasure hunt, isn't it? I mean, you right when you have an objection or something you never considered it before, you start looking and you find these, you know, nuggets of gold that are just incredible that we're just laying there in church history where people encountered the same thing and, and lots of brilliant holy people dressed it. Right. So a lot, like a lot of, a, of a, the objections to Catholicism from Protestants, we may think we've come up with some novel solution, but someone else has already done it in some way. But we could elaborate on that. We can we could piece together things from other people that came before us to, to answer that objection in a fuller way. Like Jurgen's Faith of the Fathers. It's all there too. I mean all the yeah. all the quotes that support our faith are there. Like I said, like you said, it's a treasure hunt. And when you dig for this treasure, if we're honestly we're praying for our minds to be open sincerely, this stuff will come out. Because a lot of times it's right in front of our eyes, and that's kind of, that's what happened when I was pursuing pursuing the church. I'm involved in Freemasonry, um, of course, and in Protestantism too. And I'm just uncovering these little things, like okay, so what about this? 
what about this? Well, the church has already answered this. And I know in our in our previous show about Freemasonry, Gary, we talked about how Freemasonry, the first Grand Lodge, was established in 1717 in England. And in 1738, the first pronouncement from a pope came out saying, this is not a good thing for Catholics. All that's there. Sometimes it's we have to dig into the weeds a little bit, but it's it's there. Especially with Freemasonry, because they'll say, you know, in the 1980s, and this is kind of how I got involved with it, because I had heard that the Catholic Church was against it, but I, really, I didn't know where to look at the time, because I was very... I was very young in the faith, in my search. I was very new to everything. I didn't know where to look. And so I came across um, an individual who is also a former Grand Knight in the Knights Columbus, who is also a very involved in Freemasonry. He said, look, the church said in 1981 that it's okay now. But when I realized, when I, had, when I came to that fork in the road and I realized, no, the church didn't change the church teaching. In 1917, the Code of Canon Law explicitly mentioned Masonic organizations, that Catholics couldn't be a part of them. In the 1980, in the, it's more implied. And so because Masonic wasn't in there, some thought it's an open invitation to go into a Freemasonry. Well, in 1983, Joseph Ratzinger, the future Pope Benedict the 16th, clarified it, and with permission of St. John Paul II, and he wrote, the church's negative position on Masonic Association remain unaltered, since their principles have always been regarded as irreconcilable with the church's doctrine. Hence, joining them remains prohibited by the church. Catholics enrolled in Masonic Associations are involved in serious sin and may not approach Holy Communion. Very strong stance that the church's stance hasn't changed. Now, the words in Canon Law may have changed, but the church teaching hasn't changed, and it was reiterated. And so there was a lot of confusion there. Um, that's why we saw a lot of Catholics enter Freemasonry in the early 80s because of that misunderstanding. And 2006 or seven, I was caught up in that misunderstanding. There's still a lot of people caught up in that misunderstanding. But the church teaching is very clear on the subject. Yeah. You know, it's funny. It's not like uh, there was a huge change within Freemasonry that caused the church to lift a prohibition. Nothing really changed. It's just a new canon law. But, uh, you know, it's it's funny how people will they'll kind of look for loopholes, won't they? Where it's, a, well, you know, it's not explicitly forbidden here, so... Even though nothing's really changed either in Catholic belief or in Freemasonry, you know, they'll say, well, since it's not explicit, it must be permitted. Yeah, that's right. And and on the last, um, Freemasonry has been condemned by the Church 53 times since 1738. And as we know, the Church doesn't move very fast on things. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's true. But, ve but, but very soon after the first Grand Lodge was formed... And in 1738, Pope Clement XII came out with in Eminenti, which condemned Freemasonry. It just, it just reiterated the church teachings that it's, it has all the components of religion, and therefore, free Mas therefore Catholics cannot be Freemasons. And we, and we went into some of that in our last episode about the topic, and we can, we can go further into it in the next segment with some of the other bodies of Freemasonry out there. Okay. But... Um, all the elements of religion are there. There's a supreme being. To become a Freemason, you have to believe in a supreme being. Who that supreme being is is totally up to you. So it's again, we're, we're delving into relativism, which has been condemned by the church, and is a, it's a great enemy to truth because it says there's no real truth out there, which, of course, we know Jesus, our Lord says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and Jesus did establish a church. So there is a definite, absolute truth out there. And in Freemasonry, we have there's an altar. You're taking the the oaths on an open on an open Bible. And for if you're a Christian, it is the Bible that's on the altar you're taking the oath on. If you're a Muslim, it's the Quran. If you're Jewish, it's, it's the Tanakh. It's there. You're taking an oath on a scripture of some sort. There's rituals. There's there's feast days. 
uh, St. John the Baptist is a big feast day in Freemasonry. All the elements, there, there's prayers, there's Masonic prayers that are outlined in their, in the ritual books. All the elements of religion are there, and it presents itself as a way, as an alternate way of truth. If you do this, you live a moral life, you get to the grand lodge above, or heaven, whatever your definition of heaven is. It's providing an alternate path. Whereas in Catholicism, we have the path of Jesus, we have the sacraments, we have, you know, dying to sin, living a moral life through grace. Whereas in Freemasonry, you get to that lodge above by your works and by the grace of God. So there's elements of Pelagianism in there where we can with we can do the work of we can get the we can get to heaven without grace, which is totally contrary to the gospel. Um, it's spoken against several times throughout church history. I mean, Augustine did a whole book on it against Pelagius. It's all there. That that those are some things why one, some reasons why Freemasons and Catholicism just don't mix. It's creating an alternate path than what the church says that has been been, been divinely revealed by the Holy Spirit Himself. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and uh, yeah. All those are essential elements to Freemasonry. So, uh, like I said, you know that hasn't changed. So I don't know. It's it's strange how uh, sometimes I know rank and file Catholics. They don't really give it much thought. They just, uh, in fact, I know a lot of Catholics that aren't even aware that the Church has even spoken against Freemasonry. They just think it's just a another club like, uh, you know, Lions Club or something like that. Yeah, that, exactly. They do a lot of good in the community. Um, there's a lot of charities that are supported by Masonic organizations. Uh, let's, I mean, I don't want to minimize, they're doing good work in the community. And so that, that appeals to a lot of people. And so and they see Freemasonry, they see the lodge in the, on the, down the street, and they see that it's a bunch of old men who can't even agree on what to have for dinner. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and that's true. So yeah. said, what's so bad about it? I'm, I'm I'm with these with these group of people. They're trying to teach me how to be a better husband, a better man, better in my community. What's the big deal? Well, the big deal is if you're a Catholic and you're going to Mass and you join Freemasonry, you consume the Eucharist, you're reaping condemnation on yourself because the Church has said you can't be both. So it's a big deal. It's a, it's a, a very huge deal that could have eternal repercussions. So that 53 times the church has condemned it and I hear the music, but no other time in history has the church condemned so, so many times one thing. That's very well put. We're chatting with William Hemsworth about Freemasonry. More to come on the other side of the break. You're listening to Don Apologetic. Stay tuned. Hi, this is Jesse Romero from the Terry and Jesse Show, also from Jesus 911. Let's face it, we all need to use the internet, but we need screen accountability. Why? Pornography is a huge problem, especially on the internet. And every time we tap into the internet, we get bombarded with images and temptations that degrade our humanity. So we need Covenant Eye to block these pornographic sites and advertisements from infiltrating our lives. Covenant Eyes helps us take custody of our eyes and custody of our intellect. So I recommend you go to CovenantEyes.com and type in the promo code, the NPR, to support the network. Protect yourself and your family from the imminent threats on the internet. www.CovenantEyes.com code BMPR live porn free. Thank you for listening to Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Thank you. God bless you. Keep the faith. This is Terry Barber. I want to thank you for supporting Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And here's an easy way to support us by going to smile.amazon.com and type in Catholic Resource Center or Virgin Most Powerful Radio. 
and when you log in your Amazon account and you purchase products, a portion of it will go right back in supporting Virgin Most Powerful Radio, and it doesn't cost you a dime. I want to thank you ahead of time because that supports us year-round. May God bless you and your family. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. This is Jesse Romero. You're listening to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And welcome back, everybody. And we are chatting with William Hemsworth and taking a closer look at Freemasonry. And uh, so, William, you mentioned right before the break that, uh, you know, we're all familiar with the Masonic Lodge, uh, but there are other outreaches, other groups that we should be familiar with as well. Right. So when you see the Masonic Lodge, in, whether it be in your neighborhood, your city, um, they confer the first three degrees of Freemasonry. And in Freemasonry, the third degree, Master Mason, technically is the highest level that you could go. But there's other groups that have other degrees. So you have the Scottish Rite, which actually started in France, but they, it's called the Scottish Rite. Um, that's when you have the 32nd degree, and the 33rd degree is an honorary degree and so it builds upon the third but the 32nd degree technically is not any higher than the third degree because it, it's just the higher you can go but then you have the york what's called the york right and so york you know came from england and there's, there's different steps in there and it culminates in the knights templar degree now within these high, within these different degrees in these different groups there are elements out there that some may find disturbing. You can find some Christian elements in them. And so if you're not strong in your faith, you can be like, okay, I could see how that could be seen as as, a, as allegorical or, or a metaphor for a moral tale. Uh, one such is the 26th degree in the Scottish Rite. It's called the Prince of Mercy degree. And if, for one looking in on it, Especially if you're a Christian, you could see that it's a baptism. Okay. You can see how is one purified, and I have, and I'll, I'll read it. This is from the ritual here, so people see that I'm not making this up. This is my old ritual book from the Scottish Rite, and I kept it for times such as this, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> but um, all right. They call it libation with pure water or baptism because it cleanses the body. It's emblematical of purifying the soul and because it conduces to the bodily health. So there's this element of baptism in this degree. Now, we know in you can only be baptized once in Trinitarian formula. And so this is kind of, I don't want to say it's a mockery, but it, well, you can, we, it can be definitely seen that way. And in in especially if you're doing it in an allegorical way, it could be deemed as an anti-Christian type of thing. And then later on as well, there's what they, in this same degree, there's what's called the Fraternal Supper or the Lord's Supper. And they actually use the, the words of Christ and the words of institution. This is my body. This is my blood. And so some, some of these, if you are a Christian, you'd be like, whoa, hold on. This is... This, this is not what it's supposed to be like, but Freemasonry gets around this fact by saying, if you're a Christian, you may see elements from Scripture in it. If you're Muslim, you may see um, a moral tale in these stories. If you're Jew, you, we're not proclaiming that Jesus is the Messiah who came 2,000 years ago. To you, it may be something that the future Messiah may do, and that's actually stated in that degree later on. Hmm. Interesting. It is. It's very interesting. I wasn't. I didn't actually go through this degree, but as I was re researching for the show, I came across it and I was like, "Oh my goodness! If I, if I had gone through this degree, I would probably would have walked out way sooner than I actually did." Yeah. Because I saw right away. I saw that baptism. Well, Freemasonry doesn't purify us. Baptism cleanses us from original sin. 
again, it's that whole concept of an alternate path of truth. There's only one truth. Yeah. And then, and good question. Um, sure. Um, because, uh, you know, I'm not very familiar with uh, Freemasonry. I never was a Freemason. So, uh, so as you're moving up degrees, I take it that the, uh, the religious stuff probably isn't as pronounced on the lower degrees. It's only when you get to the higher degrees that it starts touching on things like that. Right. So in the, so in the, so in the Scottish right, which is the start you have the, at the fourth degree, one of the elements of truth that they say you can look to is the tree of life, but it's the Kabbalistic tree of life. And it's supported by the three pillars of Freemasonry. And so it gets more pronounced later. It, it does get more pronounced later on. But the thing is, when you're going through these degrees in the Scottish Rite, no one really goes through them all before they get the 32nd degree. Because in the Scottish Rite, you go to what's called a reunion. And it's, it's, a sat, it's maybe one Saturday a quarter. And there are certain degrees that have to be done. But not all of them are done. Because you'll be there for three weeks, four through 32nd. There's no way to get them all done. So the 4th is required, the 14th is required, the 30th is required, and the 32nd is required. You can intermix all the other ones in between there. Okay. Um, and as I said in our last show, in the 30th degree, which is the night of Kadosh in the Scottish Rite, you're destroying the signs of hypocrisy and depotism. And one of the things you're smashing on, and you actually everyone walks through and does this, it's part of the ritual ceremony. You're smashing a crown. It could be a royal crown, whatever the case is. One of the other things you're walking over and smashing is a papal tiara. Hmm. And that's a sign of how, re how religion has enslaved people into thinking only one way and not accepting everyone as a group. So it gets very interesting. You can go deep into the weeds on it yeah. very easy very easily um in the york right which is i, I was never a part of the york right i've done some research on it and i've had some friends that had that went through it not as many degrees in the york right but as you go up the ladder in there it does require that you be a christian and so in the lower degrees you could be as long as you're monotheist, you could be part of it. As you go up, um, especially in the Knights Temple degree, which is the last one, it talks about the resurrection of Christ, how Christ is the Savior. And at the end, you have to take, it's kind of a, again, there's this element of a communion service that's in there. You have to drink these different cups. And then the fifth cup, you're drinking, it's a, it's a skull. It's a skull that you're drinking out of, and it's taken to be emblematical of the bitter cup of death, which sooner or later, every man will later taste, and that's from the ritual itself. And I was talking to a friend of mine about this, who is also, he, said, he says he's Catholic, and he's been involved in these very, for a long time. And he said, you know, I was, I was fine with, you know, I'm fine with Freemasonry, but some of the York Rite stuff, maybe I'm too Catholic, because this, these are his words. He says, maybe I'm too Catholic because I was very uncomfortable with the communion stuff that, that came later on. I was like, well, you should be, you should be uncomfortable because you're not supposed to yeah, do right. it. <laughs> <laughs> but but you're right. taking these libations to the, let me find the words here that he uses. It's made to the, un, to the unknown. Well, you're taking an oath to something that's unknown. Why would you be doing that? Especially if previously in the, degree, in the degree you're saying that Christ knowledge. So when you get up to those higher degrees, you see some of these more religious elements in there. And how if you're not strong in your faith, you could be easily led astray in relativism. You say, okay, I could take it to mean this. I could take it to mean this. When in reality, it's supposed to mean one thing, and that's why it was established. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting. So, so they're counting on you to kind of, if you are a Catholic, to uh, try to reconcile your Catholicism in start thinking in Messianic terms, right? Or Masonic terms, I mean. 
Uh, right. So if you uh, go to a communion service, then you kind of have to say, well, this isn't the Eucharist. This is something like it. So you're you're kind of rationalizing your involvement in it and kind of pushing your faith out and replacing it with this stuff. That's exactly right, Gary. When you and Catholicism, our faith should be who we are. It shouldn't just be lived on Sundays. It shouldn't just be lived when we're in front of other Catholics or Christians. It's something that we are. It's what moves us. It's what lives us. And we can't put it aside to do something else. If we're putting it aside, if we're putting our faith aside to do something else, what we're putting it aside for is essentially our faith. And that's very dangerous. I wouldn't. I can't go to a a Baptist certain Lord's Supper and partake in the cracker and the grape juice because I know it isn't the Eucharist. No, by doing so, I'm saying I believe what they're believing. Right. It's the same thing with Freemasonry. If we're going through these things and we're seeing these things that look like baptisms or things that look like the Eucharist, we're saying, okay, that's not really what it is. It merely means this. It means our search for knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. Well, we're pushing our faith to the side. And we're making that thing our faith. And I think that's where we get in trouble. And I'm not, I mean, this goes way beyond Freemasonry. We could do that with anything. We could do that with social media, you know, whatever the case is. We can put anything in the place of our faith. But that's one, that's one reason why it's dangerous to be a Freemason. There's one reason why 53 times the church has says, has said it's not a good thing, that you the, you can't reconcile the two. Because one is going to take the place of the other at some point. It may start off innocently. You say, okay, I'm trying to better myself. I'm learning these moral teachings. There comes a point, again, that fork in the road. Are you going to follow what the church says? Are you going to live your faith? Or are you going to substitute your faith for something else? And that's ultimately what happened to me. That's ultimately what happened to many other people who were in Freemasonry and who started studying Catholicism in a deeper way. Yeah, yeah very good. We're chatting with uh, William Hemsworth about Freemasonry, and you can check out William's great stuff at williamhemsworth.com, also on YouTube at The Bible Channel. We'll be right back, folks, with more on the subject and the subject. Help the Helpless, a Minnesota St. Paul nonprofit organization chaired by Father of Tear and volunteers is humbly asking you for your kind support to help the poor and the handicapped children in India and Ecuador. Through financial support from the help of the helpless benefactors, the children are provided with clothing, food, education, shelter, and the teachings of the Catholic Church. The mission is to help children thrive and become self-sufficient young adults leading productive lives. We also provide aid to poor families in Ecuador with food baskets, medicines, medical assistance, and help with funeral needs for the deceased. The work in India is done by Father Antonio's organization, St. Mary's. In Ecuador, the work is being done by the Servant Sisters of the Home of Mother. You can call us at 877-762-8857. To learn more, please visit our website, www.helpthehelpless.org. God bless you. Genesis 1.27 says, God created man in his own image. Male and female, he created them. According to Pope St. John the Twenty-Third. It is not true that some human beings are by nature superior and others inferior. All human beings are equal in their natural dignity. May God help us to look upon everyone as a person created in His image and likeness, 
and treat everyone the same without favoritism or prejudice. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show, and they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. Hemsworth about uh, Freemasonry and uh, why don't we kind of switch gears a little bit and let's look at Freemasonry from an apologetic standpoint. Right. And w- when we're talking to Freemasons, we need to be, we need to do a couple things. I think sometimes we tend to focus on the conspiracies and everything else. If we lead off with that, those walls are going to go up because they haven't seen those conspiracies. What we, what we're taught in the lodge, we're, what I was taught in the lodge, was that Catholics are allowed to become Freemasons because Catholics believe in a supreme being. And so, if you say, you know, the free, if you go to a Freemason and say Freemasonry wants to overthrow the church, you're going to get a brick wall. So I think that's very important to understand. We can't focus on those conspiracy theories. We don't. We want to. We don't want to erect those brick walls because we want to have a dialogue. We want to break down those barriers. We want to help them to see the truth. So what we could do, Gary, is we could approach it from a philosophical standpoint. At the, you know, when, at the top of the show, I talked about how we could look at what Freemasonry teaches and what the church teaches. And this can go not just for Catholicism, but for just Christianity in general. The big thing of Freemasonry is there's no absolute truth. It's up to you to determine what your truth is. And that's relativism. And, of course, Pope Benedict, Pope Benedict the XVI said that that's an extreme evil. Why is it extreme evil? Because everyone can, can say what their own truth is. But the church says, hey, no, there is a truth. You know, Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. So how could he answer that as a Freemason? It's either Jesus did say it or he didn't say it. Now we could prove that he shows it, that he, that he, they show, that he said it. We can open, we can open the scriptures, we can open that very Bible that they use in the Masonic Lodge for the degree work. We can open it to the Gospel of John and say, look, Jesus said, "I'm the way, the truth, and the life." How can you say there's all this other truth if Jesus said it himself? Either Jesus is wrong or you're wrong. And so I think that's that's kind of the I think that's the approach that we have to take is to avoid the conspiracy theories and just get to the point. Let's get to the philosophy. Because people those involved in Freemasonry are searching for something. They're searching. They're not there for the for the dinner that happens once a month. They're not there for that. They're, they may be there for the camaraderie, but they're searching for something. And if we can show them that Jesus, the church, is what they're searching for. Let's cut to the chase. We can break down those barriers. We can start having those conversations. And so we can say Jesus is the truth. Well, we could show in Scripture that Jesus established a church. We could show that as well. And coincidentally, a lot of freemasons are protestants so this can kind of go to the issue of authority as well right. within freemasonry there's not one authoritative body you have the grand lodge of england then you have the grand lodge of arizona you have the grand lodge of michigan and that grand lodge in that state is responsible for those other lodges and in some of those different lot though some of those different states the rituals themselves can be different so in freemasonry there's no authority what gives you the authority as a Freemason to say that your truth is different than my truth? You don't have one. <laughs> but again, right. Jesus, Jesus established a church. And he said the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I can prove my truth over here. 
you're saying it's subjective over here. So I think from an apologetic standpoint, Gary, if we could just get past the conspiracy theories, even what goes on in the lodge, and just focus on those, I think we can get a lot further um, with getting our fellow Catholics out of the lodge to show that, just showing them that, than saying, hey, I know what you do in your degree work, because it varies by state, we really don't know. We kind of, we can know the general, we can know the generalities of it. Let's focus on the on the philosophy. Let's focus on the theology. And I think we're going to get a lot farther for, in an apologetic standpoint to getting our Catholic art, to getting them that in full communion with Mother Church. Yeah, I agree. Because, you know, as apologists, many times we're high information apologists. And if you were going to uh, approach, say, a Mormon or Jehovah Witness and throw out uh, some of the real high teaching, like the Adam God doctrine or something like that, chances are they probably never heard of it. And since they never heard of it, they would just think, well, you're just making it up. So it doesn't really make an impact. So if you step back and say, OK, well, let's look at the big picture and what are you doing here? I, I totally agree. I think that could be a lot more effective than maybe going after the, some of the more higher and esoterical stuff. Right, because a lot of Freemasons, like I said, the York Rite, the Scottish Rite, those are optional. You don't have to do those. But what every Freemason has to do is the, uh, the entered apprentice degree, which is the first one, the fellow craft degree, which is the second, and the master mason, which is the third. If you could focus on the teachings of those three, the philosophical teachings of those three. A good example, the, the entered, apprentice, entered Apprentice degree. The big thing in there, the speech that's given towards the end, is how to get to that Grand Lodge above, and I touched on it briefly at the top of the show. It's by our works and the grace of God. Well, that kind of goes against the theology of grace, that anything good we do comes from God's grace. Okay, we can't earn it by good works. It's that free gift that we are so blessed to share. So that's that's really good news. And, and again, it contradicts the Masonic teaching. What does the church teach? Yes, good works are a part of it, but they flow from grace. We don't do good works, and then grace comes later. Right. So I, we, oh, go ahead. two things. Sorry going to get those gears going oh it's okay it's going to get those gears going it's going to get them thinking other questions will come and then we can get people out of the lodge back into the church we can get them active in the church we can if they want to be in a group similar i mean we can get them in the knights columbus i'm not saying that they're similar but if they want to be part of another social club with other men they can do the knights of columbus i mean there's a, there's the knights of saint peter claver there's a lot of groups out. There's a lot of things that the church has that are in communion with the church. And I think we just need to get away from all the conspiracy, the conspiracy theories, because 99% of Freemasons have never experienced or even heard of any of those things. And if we lead off with that, we're just going to get that brick wall. Yeah. Now, in, in terms of if you run into a Catholic who's in Freemasonry, I imagine it'd probably be beneficial to... Ask them, you know, are, do you know that the church actually forbids, you know, start that line of dialogue? Um, am I correct in that? You can. And I, th and I actually had this conversation um, a couple days ago with someone else, with someone here in town. Um, it was on Messenger, you know, because we can't go anywhere right now. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I said, you know, are you aware that the church has condemned Freemasonry 53 times? And what was the answer he gave me? Well, the new Code of Canon Law doesn't mention Freemasonry, so it's okay. Okay. He didn't know about what Pope Benedict wrote, well, then Pope Ratzinger wrote just a couple years later, with the approval of St. John Paul II, with the approval of the Pope. And so I, mess I, I sent him that message. He's like, oh, I never, I never actually heard that. Hmm. I, I never actually heard that part. I haven't heard of him since. I'll follow up with him. I haven't. I have another. There's another um, Freemasonry friend I know. He lives in the Midwest, and he actually asked me a few months ago, like, why I wasn't a Freemason anymore. And I was like, I had to make a choice. It's either follow the church 
or I can go my own way. The church says, for good reason, that I can't be a Freemason because of X, Y, Z. And I kind of did the same thing. I said, I, based, I did the whole philosophy thing. I compared the two. I said, do you think they're compatible based on these? And he said, no, I have some thinking to do. And he's been involved his whole life because there's youth groups in Freemasonry. There's the Demole for the boys up until age 18. And then at 18, they can join the Freemasons. So he's been involved in this his whole life. It's, it's like the, the family identity. His great grandfather was, his grandfather was, his dad was, and he's the first Catholic in his family. So he really didn't know. He just saw the things that his family was doing. And he thought and he saw all the good that they were doing, but he didn't know why Catholicism and Freemasonry don't mesh. Like I said, that's why I think instead of going for the gullet and saying, you do this, blah, 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 no, let's compare. Especially if we've been in it. I mean, I, I've, I know my circumstance is different than most because I went through it. I've conferred degrees on people. And I know what's hap what happens in the lodge. But if you just go into, and I can't, I can't emphasize enough. That's why I'm saying this so much. If we just go to someone and say, I know what you do in the degrees. No, block, done. That conversation's over. They may be listening, but they're not hearing. Right. So we need to get them to hear. We need to plant those seeds. Let the Holy Spirit do what the Holy Spirit does best. Convict. And if we do that, by showing how the philosophy just doesn't pan out with Christianity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, very good. And like you said, you're, you're speaking from firsthand experience. Uh, so, you know, this is invaluable intel for uh, anyone who wants to uh, rescue somebody from uh, Freemasonry. Uh, great stuff. Uh, William, you know, we only have a little bit left in the program. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, some upcoming stuff you're going to do on the, the Bible Catholic channel. Well, this Saturday we're going to be interviewing uh, our friend Steve Ray. We're going to talk about our Blessed Mother. Um, week after that, on the 22nd, we're going to talk with our friend Ken Litchfield. We're going, to talk about, about, we're going to talk about where we got the Bible, like how the Bible developed in the early church. Wow. And, of course, Ken, Ken's book, he has a lot of information on there. He's just a wealth of knowledge. And then there'll be a lot more coming because September 3rd is my last day of full-time employment at my work. And September 4th, I go full-time into this. Oh, wow. Uh, so there's going to be a lot more stuff coming. I have about eight interviews scheduled already for September, a lot of them during the week. Because um, a lot of people just can't come on Saturday. So I'm really excited and I'm thankful for my wife who just finally said, you need to do this. <laughs> <laughs> That's so. awesome. Well, hey, many blessings. We'll keep you in our prayers. Uh, thank, you. Th thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. And that is uh, William Hemsworth. And, uh, yeah, check out his stuff, folks, williamhemsworth.com. Man, the hour has just flown, but never fear. Terry and Jesse will soon be here with the Terry and Jesse Show. Thank you so much for listening, watching, and uh, God willing, we'll be back again tomorrow to do this thing. Everybody have a great day. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. In the 1990s, I lived and worked in Hollywood. But when my wife Betty's mom took ill, we relocated to Orange County. And it was during this time in our lives that I converted to Catholicism. Once my eyes were opened to the truth, I couldn't learn enough about the faith. But I had less free time than ever, especially with a long commute. That's when I discovered the real value of Catholic audio. Listening to cassette tapes transformed my daily commute into a miniature retreat. And that's the beauty of Virgin Most Powerful Radio today. Since the podcasts are archived, you can listen anytime on our smartphone app. I know how listening to Catholic audio can bring you closer to Christ and His Church. So I encourage you to visit the App Store or go to vmpr.org and download the app today. It just might change your life. I'm Matthew Arnold for Virgin Most Powerful Radio.